Mr. Isbin. Yeah, please come to the front here. So this, this is reflection, so we need a mirror to reflect, so we need the three of you here. <laughs> oh, yes, Lee? Okay, fine. Then it's just the two of you then. Okay. A uh, couple of nights back over a cocktail party, I was uh, asking my niece, who is a surgeon, uh, isn't it one two-minute drink for you because you, have, you might have a surgery tomorrow? Her response was, uh, no, uncle, uh, robots are doing everything for us. I just need to sit and watch. So, but definitely we are not solving, our technology is not solving such use cases, but there are a lot of uh, technologies that we do which might have a lot of uh, industry potential and use cases. So in this session, we picked a few uh, technology. There are a lot of things happening, but we picked a few which might be in your domain, may not be in your uh, domain. Uh, uh, pro some of the professors were not here, so some of the students will be presenting. So here we'll be talking, each one of them will talk about their technology, what they are doing, and what is unique about this technology. And then we can, uh, they'll finish their sessions and then uh, you can reflect on it. And then uh, the two ways, one is you can say, if your technology can do this, I see a use case. Or I see a use case where uh, this technology can be used. So that's the format of this uh, session, yeah. So we'll start with uh, Professor Aftab first. So Aftab has built uh, a sensor mat. Uh, so he'll be talking about that uh, technology in a couple of minutes. So these technologies, if you look at some of these, are in the process of forming a startup. Some are uh, in a stage where we are looking at where, how we can take it to the market. There are different stages of maturity when it, when it comes to the market. Uh, so they are very early stage technologies in one sense. It, this is one where we already have a few customers for certain use cases. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm uh, Professor Aftab. Um, I've been working with, uh, uh, you know, my, my uh, research is typically flexible electronics, electronics that can bend, you know, you're talking about, uh, um, you know, your Fitbit, uh, anything that is wearable. Um, so we came up with this very interesting uh, concept and uh, these are all the hats I wear. I mean, I'm a professor at some point and entrepreneur at some point and, and something else at some point. Um, so we basically came up with this uh, uh, flexible uh, pressure sensor mat that can have actually many applications. So what is a pressure sensor mat? It's basically what it says. It, it, it's a, it senses pressure. It's a, it has a lot of pixels um, that basically provide pressure uh, distribution. You know, you can have pixels like all of the order of uh, in one feet by one feet area, something like 1000 pixels and that will provide you a very beautiful color map of you know what your pressure distribution looks like. You can put it on the chair, you can put it on a mattress, you can stand on it. All of those applications are there. And the way we were able to do it is, again, using some, uh, you know, leaf from uh, polymer thin film technology. Uh, you know, we use a carbon composite material to make a piezo resistive thin film. And uh, basically had a crossbar architecture for the metal electrodes. And when we are, once we were able to do that and solve some of the the research problems that come up with this like in terms of reliability, crosstalk, the math of it and everything else, we can actually do a lot of things and we have been working on it for the past two years and this is what we have been doing. Um, first of all, we came up with this very simple concept that we can actually put it on a, mat, a, a table and a patient or somebody can actually put a load somewhere so you can basically draw something on it like, like a circle and you can ask a stroke patient or somebody who is recovering from muscle uh, movement problems to place a load there. So where are they placing that, that load? How much time they are taking? Like you can ask them to move it from point A to point B 10 times. 
their accuracy can actually be very like of placing and all of those things and be very well uh, you know uh, uh, reported using this kind of a, a, a mat and the timing as well. So, you can actually quantize their improvement over time. Uh, so, it was fun. I mean, we, we wrote a paper about it and, and uh, you know, it, that was it. This was 2021, uh, last year April. And then we realized that uh, we need to do some more math. You know, realize that we need to do a lot of reliability study because if you are actually talking about a product that is going to go in the market, for years it has to work, it has to work over, like if it's going to be flexible, it has to work over bending cycles. So, that is one of the key metrics that we actually look at number of bending cycles versus output voltage for a given, uh, you know, applied load, whether it's varying too much, it should not vary too much is what we want it, I mean, it, it, it should be constant. So, all those constant lines are actually good. Uh, we want it to be that way. Uh, so, we do some reliability testing. Uh, uh, one of the unpublished works that we have is actually reliability over two years. So, one of the experiment is actually going on for the past couple of years and we have been testing reliability for the same device. We take it out of the cabinet, measure it, put it back in every two weeks. So, like a data of like a hundred over a hundred uh, you know weeks is there and then we realized okay, let us look at some serious applications. So, one of the applications that one of my students came up with and he is a, he is a bodybuilder. So, he does those reps, he is the one who is doing those reps. He realized that uh, we can probably use this kind of a pressure sensor to actually put position on a, a tight suit, okay, like, like what they wear for you know uh, in, a, in a gym for instance and based on the pressure that you are applying and I mean uh, and the way you are actually uh, repping, I mean the, there is a good position and a bad position for the spine when you are doing deadlift for instance. And other exercises have their own problems. I mean, you know, you have to do exercise in a specific posture to make sure that you get most benefit out of it and not don't hurt yourself. So, based on that positioning of the sensors and where what muscles we are actually putting it on, you can actually figure out really accurately. By the way, I mean, this gives re remarkable accuracy just by like just denoising and thresholding. There is no AI there. Uh, there is this is no no ML or AI or anything. It's just thresholding and uh, you know denoising that we do, and you get some re remarkable like you can at least get uh, tell a good rep from a bad rep very easily just by simple data analysis. Uh, so we did that, and then um, like Prakash said, this is like uh, slightly more mature uh, thing. We actually made a mat that is again one feet by one feet, one thousand sensors. You can stand on it, and it gives you a uh, planter pressure distribution. Uh, this is actually. Uh, and I, to be honest with you, I didn't know it's any of of any use whatsoever. I was like, "Con kya karega iska?" I mean, <laughs> so it gives you pressure. So I do? It turns out it's very important. I mean, if you talk to the right people, talk to the right doctors, it's this gold for them. Okay, uh, podiatrists, diabetologists, for instance, use this a lot uh, to figure out whether you have foot ulcer or, or, or have the potential to have foot ulcers. Uh, of course, you know your sports, uh, you know athletes and all of those things, uh, all of those people also use it a lot. So, people are happy about it, we are selling it like Prakash said, this is one of the products that is actually going out in the market right now. But what we really want to do is make a smart chair, okay. That is my, I want to be like I always say my, told my students, we want to be the Tesla of chairs, okay. We want to make a smart chair that will basically tell you whether you are whether your sitting posture is correct, whether you have been sitting for too long, whether you need to take a walk because you have been sitting for too long and very worst case, like last case, identify who is sitting on the chair, okay. Uh, and because we are talking about mobility and you know data driven technologies and all, uh, could have a very good uh, application in a, uh, on the seat of a car, right. You can A, identify who is driving and let the car not switch on if the driver is wrong or whatever, I mean if you have enough data of the baseline of the user and B, you can see whether they are slouching or starting to slouch or they are feeling sleepy or they have been driving for 4 hours. So, you can ping them, okay, you have been driving for too long and all of those things can, uh, you know, can be integrated with this kind of a, of a system. So, uh, we are very excited, long way to go still, the data is still grainy, uh, but we will hopefully get there. <laughs> Thanks, Aftab. I think I wish I had this into a car today. Today I almost hit a Porsche and a Mercedes while coming because, because after marriage, lunch, I almost uh, slept off on the steaming. <laughs> so next I would request uh, uh, Professor Avinash's student, Astit, to talk about the 3D modeling work they are doing. Weight from 84 kgs to 70 kgs.
but that was really hard surface. Wish we had a surface like this. Yeah, hi. So I am uh, Astitya Srivastava. I am here to present the kind of work we do under doctor acting and then how we, we are using that data for our AI systems. So first, let me just quickly introduce Dr. Vinash. So this is Dr. Vinash, and he is currently assistant professor at Triple IT. He has done his MS from here. He has done PhD from Andrea and uh, uh, INP Grenoble. He had been a research scientist in Xerox Research India, and now he leads this three division group at CVIT. And I am assistant Astish Rasta. So why do we need this 3D human body modeling? So there are uh, technical use cases like in VFX and animation, you need 3D copies of your uh, actors and then you need digital avatar creation for media purposes, for 3D virtual and try on for Windows shopping, and for various use cases in AR, VR, and metaverse. But the most important use case is training deep neural networks, which requires some 3D related task. Other non-technical use cases are heritage preservation and immersive education. Heritage preservation means if we want to pr uh, like preserve Indian classical folk dances, how do we do that in 3D? So quickly, just 3D representations, to give a brief overview, like point cloud is just like uh, a distribution of points in 3D spaces. Then you have mesh, where you have a set of triangles. And if you have more number of triangles, your geometry looks nice. If you have less, it looks curved, but it's like uh, it's more efficient, memory efficient. Then we have this voxelization, so it's 3D equivalent of image. You have image which is divided into pixels. If you take this whole volume divided into grids, each grid could be zero or one. Based on that, we get a 3D model. Okay, so now we talk about a static acquisition, like how do we capture human interest? Are uh, human standing still? How do you capture it? So we have this uh, handle scanner in our lab called Arta Kiva. So what it does is project some uh, strips and patterns, and based on this, it analyzes how the curve is deforming, and based on that, we can scan it, and this is the quality of the scan that we can get through it. And we have curated a, a, a whole data set of around 200 meshes using this. But humans are not static, they tend to move a lot. Like so, okay, what about dynamic motions, like, like this? So, this is me like, uh, like jumping from one problem statement to another. And so we have this multi-view connect capture setup where we have around four cameras. We have actually seven, but we're just showing four for now, which captures the depth map, but it's very noisy, right? So it, it doesn't give us the data quality that we require for 4D data capture. So what we do is we post-process this data so this is like initial, the red blob that you are seeing is initial noisy data. We track the important parts of the human body over the time and slowly as it progresses, the noise reduces. So you can see the reduction is noise is happening over the time. And this you can see the difference between the pre before, the before optimization and after optimization. Okay, so we got the data. Now what do we do with the data, right? So in real world, we generally, not everybody has 3D sensors. What do we have? We have phone, we have RGB photos, right? So can we get 3D models directly from 2D images? Can we make use of this data that we have collected, right? Yes, supervised deep learning can help us do that. So, they f so let's say you have given a 2D images. What are the challenges that uh, restricts us to directly take 3D models? First is like you have various kind of complex and skewed poses that AI needs to understand. You have different uh, kind of loose clothing. If you consider India, we have saris, dhotis, kurtas. Then this layered clothing, which is very challenging. I'll be giving one clothing on top of another. How do you even see that? Then you have self-occlusion, like I'm folding hands, so you're not seeing my chest at all. And there could be different lighting conditions, which allow us to, it makes very hard, right? So when we talk about uh, getting 3D bodies from 2D images, there could be two kind of bodies. One is parametric. So it just gives you the shape and pose of the person, right? So given an image, what is the possible pose and shape of the person you can analyze? And there is you want accurate 3D uh, model of the uh, person with clothing details, wrinkle details, hair, and all. So these are two paradigms. So we tackle first paradigm, like parametric body model, where we, from one image, we train two joint encoders to get this uh, template, parametric template that you see, which gives accurate shape and pose. Okay, but it does not give me accurate uh, clothing details and all. What do we do? Okay, so uh, these are some results on internet images of shape and pose we get, S but we want more. We want more clothing details, hair details and all. So we came up with this representation called PLUman. 
So what it does is it takes the human body and encodes into four peeling layers. So if I'm standing like this, and this is the camera, camera shoot light rays, right? So consider this is a hollow mesh. Why hollow? Because we are not interested in modeling internal organs of my body. We're just interested in surface. So a rays go like this and came out through, uh, through my back. So there are two intersections. But my hand is like this, then there could be one, two, three, four intersections. So divide into four peeling layers. We have four depth maps and we have four RGB maps. And we can back project this depth maps to find a point cloud. Now, what happens is during inference, I have just given this view from the camera that you are seeing, that view from the camera, and now I have to predict all these four depth maps and remaining two RGB layers. So that's what we do with our uh, this uh, paper called Sharp. So given one input image, we predicted this whole point cloud of it, and so basically this explains it the more. The way we are doing this, we are disentangling this representation into two. So first part is getting this body shape and pose. Then we just get the deformation from that body pose and shape. And then we especially take another model which models loose clothing deformation. And then we combine it to get the loose clothing aspect of the clothes. And these are our results. Even on Kurta, we, we are able to get this loose clothing deformation just from one single image. And these are some other uh, another examples. So Virat Kohli is my favorite cricketer, so I say, why, why not? Let's try one there. And then one problem with this sharp is currently is uh, uh, was that uh, it cannot differentiate between whether a part of the cloth is actually a wrinkle or a color itself, texture itself. So how do we tackle this? So that's what we do in ref sharp, where we pass a, a wrinkle map prediction to it, which uh, basically we train the model in a self-supervised way, which uh, uh, asks which trains the network to identify between wrinkles and actual color, because we have the ground truth data. And it also helps in refining the uh, uh, person appearances like facial details and all. So you can see further improvements in the results. Then we add segmentation module to it, uh, to the same peel map representation, to get just the garments out of it. So it can be directly used for virtual try-on applications. So you can see we can there get this loose clothing. And an uh, another thing we added on top of it is texture map. So what it allows is, it allows, so again the same Virat Kohli is my favorite cricketer. So then we allow this uh, appearance ma uh, manipulation, this texture map thing. So I can now do this, uh, we can now swap any pattern that we want on the cloth and we are done with it. It also allows, so if input image is blurry, we can always super resolve the texture map to further enhance the details. So even you, my data is noisy, even then I can get a better uh, texture quality of the cloth. And this is the data that we do supervised training on, and we have collected this in our own lab. And this is a demo of that data. Like we have collected around 200 scans of people under various types of clothing. We target mostly loose clothing and Indian ethnic wears like kurta, dhoti, and we have few examples of sari as well. But it's still, sari is a very uh, challenging problem to solve because it's a you wrap it around. So how do you actually model it? And yeah, that's it. So this is our group. We do a lot of interesting stuff. You can check it out. Uh, thank you. Thank, thanks, Ashish sir. So next time you may not need Virat Kohli for a Maserati ad, right? We just take him once. You can create Ramesh Avatar, put it in the Maserati and say, Ramesh, here is your Maserati, take it. So next, uh, we have a, a student from Professor Raghuradi's uh, team here. He's also out of station. So he'll talk about the ad. Hello all. So uh, myself, Pawan Kumar, Yandigiri. So I work under two labs. Uh, first is the Software Engineering Research Center and uh, Center of VLSI and Embedded Technologies. So our work jointly uh, overlaps with the area of embedded systems in the, in the field where both hardware and software have to play an important role, which is in embedded systems. So Professor Raghu majorly works on uh, uh, ad advancements in uh, software algorithms and uh, the more uh, software part of it. And uh, we also work on the VR or AR aspect of it. So I am actually the hardware person in the software engineering uh, lab. So talking about the problem statement, like uh, we have heard many buzz about Meta, right? So uh, the, the evaluation or the amount of attention it is getting is huge since last uh, uh, two to three years. 
but AR, VR technology is relatively new as compared to other technologies. And uh, uh, the scale that Meta is trying to project is like uh, uh, the, the way television sets are present in our house. Uh, same way VR, AR headsets will be present in the next uh, coming decade. So that is the plan. But there are certain challenges uh, because uh, what they're trying to project is, uh, for example, if we say uh, uh, these glasses, right? Now they are saying uh, uh, th there are many companies like Tesseract or Google uh, AR glasses which failed uh, miserably because the hardware is not supporting the actual concept. So there are many uh, problems like uh, uh, how to reduce the size of the processor in such a way that it, it is able to not only see but even perceive and apply an AI model to it. So, uh, but we are just uh, giving it a step is, uh, stepping stone. So, once the research progresses, uh, there will be advances. So, the problem statement that we majorly focused on was to build our own head-mounted device. So, head-mounted device is the uh, system which uh, goes onto your head. It will have its own screen. It will have its own motion tracking unit. Based on that, it will. Uh, Basically, it will teleport you to some virtual environment. So, when whenever you will be administered with that device, right? So, you will be able to uh, roam in a virtual environment based on whatever the scene is designed. So, currently in market, there are many de such devices, and this is not uh, new. So, there in past there has been many uh, things like even in our uh, village fairs, there used to be some uh, kaleidoscopic. Uh, uh, devices. So those are nothing but a basic head mounted device. So based on that, so if you see the presently latest uh, head mounted device that was uh, projected by Facebook, uh, now known as Meta, was Oculus Quest. So if you see the uh, pricing, it is close to $400. So the main problem statement uh, can be addressed if we are saying that we want to reach uh, as deep as television sets, right? we should work on the economical aspect, right? Because uh, televisions were uh, costly when uh, they were initially manufactured. Even the mobile phones, size-wise, cost-wise, they were costly. But eventually, now, uh, uh, the cost factor was important to be uh, available to the commercial masses. Otherwise, commercial masses uh, won't see it. it. They will see it, uh, it as a fancy item that is just uh, used by the higher class. So the cost is the main... Uh, uh, king of our research. So what we tried to do was we, be, we tried to customize uh, the head mounted device by making it more application specific. So application which we focused on was in, in the field of ophthalmology. So the problem statement was uh, for a given Indian population, there are the ratio of uh, actual Indian population to the number of optimizations is very less. And almost 60% of Indians are visually uh, facing uh, health disorder, visually disorders like either eye power or astigmatism or burning sensation. So these normal things are there. So this uh, was the demography that we are trying to address because this will not only validate the product on the commercial basis, but also wi it will give us a uh, usability study on how Indian population adapts to this new technology. So we tried to build our own head mounted device. So the architecture wise, uh, so there are some contributions based on how to how does the react how does the system react to the such sensitive head movement? What if a person sneezes while uh, tracking? What will will the system go havoc or what? Uh, so all those algorithms and uh, those things are captured in that. We have published a paper on it. And uh, the design wise, right? So uh, we initially checked this design on uh, the uh, communities in IIIT. So based on that, we. So we began with the monoscopic model. So in monoscopic model, you will just uh, in insert one eye. So it is basically same as television sets. In television sets, your both eyes are seeing only single picture. And stereoscopic is what binocular uh, vision. So whenever you see in binocular, right, uh, two images will, will be perceived by you as a single image, but data are completely different. So basically, your eyes are two monoscopic images with certain distance, which is called as an interocular distance, distance between our two eyes. So based on that, we customized our model. So now we needed an application. So with uh, based on that, uh, based on our usability, right, 
we found certain problems like uh, what are the variations, display, latency. So s challenges were mainly in the field of hardware because when you want to put everything in a small box which needs an accuracy because in healthcare accuracy or any uh, any parameter is uh, can be given less uh, priority but accuracy should be the highest priority because uh, the problem that we'll address, right, it will affect in a uh, different way like uh, for example, uh, when you go to an uh, cl eye clinic, right, they will have a uh, Snellen chart and uh, then he'll ask you to read out some words. Based on that, he will predict your power. But there are very high chances that same uh, scenario will fail in other city. Some 0 0.25, 0 0.5 diopters will be changing. So based on the lighting conditions, parameters, right, so these values are also changing. So current solution is also not valid. So that we try to address with our own uh, uh, product, we can say. So, so customizable head-mounted device for ocular disorder detection. So what this device does is, when you wear this device, we will be able to diagnose your myopic vision. So uh, how much is your power? How do you have color blindness? Are you suffering from astigmatism? Or whether you have, my, uh, there is a retinal uh, layer. So whether you have retinal distortion which is age-related macular degeneration. So how this device works is it will, it will project an uh, Snellen chart on the, two, on the LCD screen. LCD screen will be having stereoscopic visions. So stereoscopic vision based on that, uh, your one eye will be tested. We will have certain procedures. Based on that, your left eye power will be prescribed, then right eye. And uh, uh, we tested this on the uh, participants of the IIIT based on the eye power and uh, we achieved an accuracy of 87% for all the diseases and especially for myopic vision we achieved on 93%. So the accuracy will be increased based on the hardware we develop. So the, uh, the if you see our resolution, right? Our uh, current resolution that we offer is much less than whatever the industry standard is there. So, so th this will happen because we are using those uh, displays which are not made for AR, VR headsets. So once we build our own flagship, right, so th this is what the next phase will be. Now currently we are using uh, market uh, available uh, microprocessors controllers. If we build our own microprocessor just for this device, the cost will also re uh, reduce down. So currently we are giving it in less than $50 as a start price, so prototype cost will be uh, more, but eventually market price will be one-fourth of prototype cost. That is what the plan is. So based on that, uh, we will be uh, trying to be a head-on uh, fight with presently VR devices. And this research is, uh, uh, as we are focusing on uh, uh, economically weaker sections, right? So this project is completely open source. The designs are open source. There is no patent uh, because then it will again uh, uh, count, uh, counter our own motivation, which was to uh, go into common masses. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Bhavan. So next, I will request uh, Professor Sachin to, yeah, yeah, David, okay. So we have the two ideas for coming from Professor Sachin's lab. So one is in water monitoring and one is pollution. So David, uh, who will be running the startup out of this in technology, he'll talk about the water monitoring thing. So another idea for that is you can show Ramesh's Maserati through that glasses itself. <laughs> let's, not, let's not give them ideas. We'll get the real
uh, hi i hope i'm audible yeah so i remember my dad uh, telling me like 2 to 3 days ago about one of his saddest time in his life was to sell us the first house that he actually made the amount of memories that he had with him and i remember him clearly telling me you only know you love something when you actually let it go so i'm thomas david nc i'm working with sachin chaudhary sir uh, in spcrc and we're working on water monitoring so in a city like hyderabad uh, 160 crore liters of water is pumped into the city every single day out of which 77 crore liters of water goes wasted that is primarily due to on uh, the transmission phase that is uh, a lot of water gets uh, stolen and there is a lot of leakage and a lot of water goes contaminated so we can't use that and this amount of water that is wasted can easily power 1 lakh houses daily consumption levels and this water that could not generate any revenue for the government of telangana is called as non revenue water and that is 48% that is 48% of the water could not generate any revenue 40% of the water is just lost and if we take it into the finance uh, side of it we see that 3.43 crore liters of 3.43 uh, uh, crore rupees worth of water is lost every single day government of telangana has to push in 3.43 crore liters of water every single day so that it means the daily demand and a yearly loss of more than 1000 crores so there is definitely something wrong so primarily understanding actually like what the challenges in water monitoring primarily is like the infrastructure that we actually built is pretty vulnerable that is you could actually step onto a pipe and the pipe might break and you won't see the particular noticings of it in uh, various things and we right now have very poor analysis methods that is available to the public perhaps various corporates can have it but even if we have it it's pretty expensive and uh, not affordable to a common person in a colony where around 100 people live if they want to solve water problems costing around 10000 rupees they can't install a uh, solution worth 1 lakh rupees right it's just not practical so that is where the uh, indian market comes in and it is tedious and laborious so one plumber will have to go maintain everything every day so it's a tedious process and there is definitely lack of knowledge that we see so a lot of people don't know actually like how much water is wasted and perhaps take it for granted they really don't understand what the loss is so what we're trying to do over here was understanding as to like what the problems are and over here we built in three uh, uh, we were working on three research uh, domains that is uh, we created a smart retrofit for analog water meters and smart uh, water level detectors and then worked on the network analysis of uh, water pipes and uh, tanks so we have the traditional analog water meters so in triple it hyderabad we have around 30 of them and one plumber has to go there every single day and check as to like what the level of water in, in in it is right so it's a tedious work it, uh, it uh, one person has to go there ev to every node note it down on his paper come back and put it it's a data entry job basically so one solution probably could be to replace the old meter with a digital one but for that it's pretty expensive not all can afford so right now to replace just one meter it costs around 40 to 50000 rupees and uh, at the same time we have to stop the entire pipeline make sure the no water flows out we have to cut the pipes replace it with a new one it's again a tedious job so we thought of like implementing it with the indian style of it was to like create a retrofit something that can be kept on top of the existing uh, analog water meter so we created a retrofit that is kept on top of the existing one and it is a vision based technology that is it will click photos and at the same time do machine uh, image recognition on top of it and send the data and not the image so a huge bandwidth of image is also saved and at the same time we can do this in uh, we are doing this at real time so every single minute we are seeing actually like how much water is being uh, flown so this was the first thing that we did and sooner or later we realized why not implement it to detect leakage that is we can have two we definitely have a lot of meters here so at the source if x amount of water is flowing that means x amount of water should also reach the end that the that is the destination and if at all there's a difference between the both uh, there is definitely a leakage so we integrated with that as well and we have 20 of these nodes running around in triple it right now giving uh, accurate values up to uh, 98 percent so this is the uh, uh, water meter image that we capture and then we extract the region of interest and then go to the indi individual digits and then upon uh, 
a digit recognition, we extract the features and get the images. And sooner or later, we found out like there are channels, there are maps. So based on that, we mapped out the entire triple IT networks of water lines and saw actually like there could be potential leakage. The portion that is uh, marked red is the uh, region where there could be uh, major challenges in, uh, uh, in sort of monitoring the water. And uh, we are actually monitoring the flow rate as well as the entire flow that is happening through the day. And uh, at the same time, we're sending the water data directly to the plumbers who really don't have to walk anymore to that places. So directly uh, through Telegram, we were sending them the uh, daily data at 6 o'clock in the morning or whenever they require it. Then what we did was uh, we completed with the pipe sort of thing, but at the same time, the water flowing from the pipe should reach the tank. So what we thought of like, let's monitor the water tank also. So we created a smart water level detector, which is kept on top of the tank and uh, it uses basic ultrasonic sensors and uh, what it detects is um, the level of water. And since the uh, periphery of the tank is fixed, the volume is estimated. So the water flowing from the pipe through the water meters uh, will raise the tank. And if at all there is any discrepancy between the same, we are able to monitor them as well. And at the same time, we are able to see actually like what the trends in summers during night and day uh, clearly were and as estimate as to like when a possible uh, shortage of water could be and this was under the predictive analysis part of it. So we actually made a network analysis actually like which pipe goes at which instance in the buildings and uh, right now what we're trying to do is predictive analysis at what point of time uh, will water flow and one thing that we uh, really wanted to do was like we don't need to trigger these devices at every instant of time. Rather than when we, uh, we can have a uh, predictive analysis as to like when water could potentially flow and at that point of time we uh, detect the readings as well as the water levels. So this was under the uh, predictive analysis and then leakage detection was another thing we did. And uh, based on the sampling frequency of the working of the device, we can actually uh, trigger the devices only when it is actually required. Not every minute will be sufficient. So in IIIT we're having a sampling frequency of 15 minutes. So only every 15 minutes water will flow at every 15 minutes. And uh, then energy efficiency of the meter, like making it standalone systems uh, compared to uh, the power supply, making it on the solar grid. And there are definitely, there is definitely a huge loss of water uh, in the entire world. And the next war that will be fought upon will be on water, not on nuclear missiles and all. Definitely they will be part of it. And uh, definitely a lot of people don't accept the fact that water is a critical source. They don't show the love for it. But uh, a lot of men and women have uh, lived without uh, lived uh, without love. But at the same time, uh, none of them actually lived without water. So who's in for saving some water? Thank you. Thanks, David. So I request Professor Sachin to, so he is behind both these technologies. So he has, again, done some work on uh, pollution monitoring. So you have reason to put the car on the road, he has reason to get it off the road. So. Hello. So good evening. Um, yeah. So uh, this is uh, the water meter David was talking about, uh, the retrofit one, and then this is the water level one. So uh, and this is the air pollution I will be talking about. So uh, okay. By the time uh, they put up the slides, uh, just let me introduce uh, first. Uh, good evening. Good evening to all of you. And my name is Sachin Chaudhary. I am an associate professor here at the Signal Processing and Communication Research Center. I am also very actively associated with the Smart City Research Center. And uh, we all know that the air pollution is very critical issue in India. Uh, world, it's, it's a critical issue world over with lot, many people, millions of people dying every year and many more getting sick, seriously sick. Okay, I think. It's, yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, the ho what we want to do now is that if you see the current monitoring systems, right? So uh, the whole city of Hyderabad of 650 kilometers square has hardly six pollution monitoring sessions by CPCV. Okay, what does it mean is that uh, you can see this uh, points, six green points, which has pollution uh, that monitor stations, and we leave it, let's say, in Gachipoli. So the nearest one is the HCO. The the point is that. Uh, it's al already two kilometers away and the pollution values will change every 
few 500 meters, okay, 500 meters, one kilometer, already the values are uncorrelated, which means whatever the values it's showing in SU is not for me. So what we are uh, pushing for is that street level pollution monitoring. Obviously, we, we can't afford the crore rupees uh, monitors which CPCB is deploying. So what we are going is with the, a low cost street level pollution monitoring. And uh, so this is very initial work. Uh, so the idea is to get some actionable insights of government for government and citizens. So these are very initial ideas what might be commercial uh, let's say applications at least for water we know for sure. Uh, I have somebody who is working let's say uh, uh, he is the CEO and he will be taking forward the startup but here I, I do not have clarity but these are some initial ideas which are in my uh, in our mind in our team's mind. So just like one ex application can be path planning for lowest air pollution right people some people uh, have asthma and all and they want to let's say even uh, want to travel then they might want to take a road which is not quickest but uh, least polluted. Second can be property buying let's say if I have a map of air pollution in the city and if let's say I know that consistently a particular area is polluted I definitely would not want to buy a house there. Third can be insurance premium so basically insurance companies can charge a premium so let's say if uh, we get, in, get to know where the person is living, right? So we know how much uh, pollution is, is, is he uh, exposed to and even if he's driving a car, this kind of a compact sensors can be put in inside the car and you come to know how much pollution is exposed to, right? So based on that, you can get some idea and then maybe the insurance can be uh, charged. So this is very just a, a preliminary thoughts, not, so it still needs a lot of brainstorming, but anyway. The idea is that we started with a uh, buying off the shelf sensor, right? So we didn't want to get into development, but we soon realized uh, even very expensive, expensive nodes in the market, they were not performing that well and there were a lot of issues, okay? So we soon realized that we need to develop our own uh, because we were also doing a research project. So uh, and we wanted to deploy these 50 nodes in very small area of uh, 4 kilometer squares. So we have developed this uh, air pollution monitor and uh, uh, basically which has a, which is monitoring currently 2.5 ton and temperature humidity and this is robust against power and communication failures and uh, this IP65 bo box is there for outdoor deployment and it is pretty robust that it has been running uh, since last two years uh, in, in actual field outside campus, not inside campus but outside campus and it's cost around uh, 10k. So this is a deployment plan. You can see that uh, almost 35 nodes are in Gachiboli region and then some of them are also deployed on the uh, traffic poles, uh, what, what is it called, street lights, okay, uh, so on the road. So this is uh, in collaboration with the uh, Telangana government. So they have provided this access to the uh, uh, street lights. You can see actual deployment and also the, this is in the inside the car, this is outside. Uh, the design is compact enough that it can be easily placed inside the car and also on the top. And this is the dashboard we have developed for looking at the, uh, the uh, air pollution values. And uh, you can see that this is a uh, special interpolation is also there on top of it. So you get an idea what's happening. And uh, then if you click any of the buttons, you will get this kind of a 24 hour history. Okay. Uh, then there's also an Android application already. Uh, in addition to that, what we also done is that was a stationary deployment of 50 nodes, but we are also working on collecting data using car. So this is a IHUB car and I think we have been using it uh, really uh, well. So uh, so what we did is we put uh, some sensors on top of this car and we have been collecting data throughout, uh, let us say, uh, this is the data collection with this car. and few nodes we have deployed in Zenith buses. So the Zenith is a local college, uh, engineering college. We are collaborating with them and then uh, on, so we do not have buses so we are putting on their uh, buses. So daily the data is collected on three buses. And then this is data collection over India. So during COVID uh, my student went from here to his home in car. So he took air pollution uh, node and collected data over the highway. So, uh, so we have basically we have been trying to do a very thorough research on air pollution. Uh, we evaluated several PM sensors and then published, uh, we chose things, we developed 
this end to end uh, solution for uh, air pollution uh, nodes which is uh, low cost. Uh, we are also working on energy efficient thing and then we are trying different uh, mobility cases like uh, walk static stationary uh, walking cycle bike and deploying on the buses and commercial vehicles and we are also working on this collection of data on gaseous pollutants in Hyderabad right now and we also try to do this security evaluations because IoT is very sensitive network, it is easy to hack. So we are also trying, we also have a team which keeps trying to hack into the, uh, the our IoT network. Uh, so then uh, what happened is that the sensors are a very tricky uh, thing, okay. So they keep failing. So uh, when we wrote a proposal, we wrote for 50 nodes and we only wrote for 50 sensors. But till now we already replaced 100 sensors. Like every six months or one year they are failing. So what we realized soon, first one, one thing is India is not manufacturing any sensor. Like uh, and if you get it from China at low cost, it keeps failing. If you get it from let's say uh, Western countries, it's very expensive. So what we thought is can we replace uh, sensors? So that's what we started also working on that aspect. So here what we are doing is we are trying to train a camera to tell the value for air pollution. Okay, so what we do is in this experiment we collect data over 7 days uh, with this basically this uh, node which has a Pi cam as well in addition to the pollution sensor and then run YOLO to understand how many vehicles are there and also use BRISC to check the visibility score and then use that, that as a feature vector and to understand what is the AQI value. So here we are not interested in value but we are interested in band. Okay, I think that is a good actionable uh, insight. Okay, that can give you. So we are not interested in actual value. Keep in mind that these are low cost sensors, so uh, the accuracy might, might not be great, but it still gives very good. Uh, let's say with, with good accuracy, it can still give you which band you are in, and it can still you can use that data to come up with some actionable item, uh, insights. So we got very good results, like 82% uh, accuracy just using camera. Another is <coughs> now instead of camera I have traffic data from Google right or here maps. So can I use that to estimate pollution at with certain level of accuracy. So what we did is we used here map and which has density right traffic density you can see that free sluggish low. So we use this parameter to estimate again uh, pollution because we had this 15 nodes on the road right. So so although it's not giving actual value, it's still giving you a good indication what might be the, uh, let's say, depending on the region, it, it still gives you good indication what kind of pollution levels are there. And uh, so I, I didn't show any of the papers, but yeah, uh, we have published 10 international conference papers, two journals are submitted on this, three MS thesis, five M, uh, MS thesis ongoing, and we have filed already two patents. And we have been winning uh, international, national, international level hackathons on air pollution now. And another, this uh, is one more, this simple indoor CO2 monitoring uh, node. So we developed this during COVID and deployed in IIID 20 nodes, uh, which will alert if some kind of, let's say, uh, crowd is aggregating some place. Uh, so we can then apply basically the COVID norms. Okay. Either basically people are, uh, the value, CO2 values might go high if there are too many people, it is crowded or second is the ventilation is bad. So in both the cases basically alert will go to the, uh, our general administration team and they will come and check and then correct, take corrective actions. So thanks, I really thank you for this opportunity and I will be happy to answer any questions and I am looking for a team and ideas to productize this. Thank you. Thank, thanks Sachin. So now I request uh, all the speakers, Professor Aftab, such that we can stay here. Yeah. Astitra and Pawan to come here. By the way, we have a, a patent on uh, optimal routing of vehicles okay. based on pollution. That is pra Professor uh, Praveen. So I open uh, the floor for uh, questions, inputs, directions. Come, come, come. We'll start with you, but anyone else in the audience has some, some inputs, please feel free to. Uh, on the, on the presentation, sir, uh, on the presentation, sir uh, did you look at this uh, footwear kind of 
thing. See, um, what we, what we, what I know at least personally is that uh, everyone's foot is different, and uh, we don't have the right shoes for everyone, right? So sometimes what happens? You buy a shoe, then you realize that this is not the one for you. Then you change. Many people in India, many people don't know that some of them has flat foot. We don't even know, right? So I think that could be a that could be. I don't know if you have thought about it, but just I wanted to sound it out. Yeah, there's actually a so there's a company called Radiate. Uh, we are partnering with them, uh, and they are actually into uh, 3D printing custom insoles. So what they are doing is that they are going to take data from our mats, okay. and they have some own algorithms of like taking like images. Like somebody was talking about image, like reconstructing 3D information from image. So they are using, they are going to use our system also to enhance their, that uh, capability or make sure that that is the right uh, structuring. And uh, one of the applications they are looking at is 3D printing custom insoles. Yeah. So something like that. So that is, we are in talks with that. So yeah. I am guessing it can. Uh, <laughs> it's one of the problems is that elite uh, sport is actually a very difficult market to get into. Um, so I think if we prove ourselves, uh, you know, locally, then we can probably start. Like we'll, we'll catch the attention of elite athletes, and we'll see where it goes. Well, I think uh, for the athletes, I think athletes, I think they're especially they are made, right? Yeah, of course. So they for are. the FIFA players and so. I'm guessing so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They will make the mold and they create it out of it. But I think for mass population, where we don't know. Yeah. Also, this is very low cost as well. I mean, uh, so. Uh, if you look at the competitors that we have, there is a US based company uh, that sells the same uh, mats for 3x, 4x and they are not even flexible. They are rigid structures, that they look like a weighing scale, they are rigid, they are not very difficult to carry and everything else. So these are flexible and uh, because my research is on flexible electronics and uh, material science, I feel like uh, when you make something flexible, more opportunities open up. Like those rigid mats, you can't make it into a chair or a or mattress or something like that. So we are looking at that. I mean, like just to uh, elaborate on that point, uh, we are also collaborating with one of the one of the uh, uh, another company to see if we can actually uh, miniaturize the mat in the form of a sole. So we can basically put it in anybody's shoe, and they can walk, and you get the pressure differences. And so, again, a lot of engineering challenges are there, but it's a very exciting time to be in this space right now. Everybody is like uh, a lot of focus is there right now. One question I also have, so same thing. The, does it, uh, the performance varies with respect to the moisture, the temperature? Uh, the, 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 isn't it varying the performance? Uh, no, so the, 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 the key, um, you know, sensing element here is the uh, carbon composite thin film, which is piezo-resistive in nature. So which, which means that it has a certain resistance. When it's pressed, its resistance changes. That is what we are basically looking at. Uh, the resistance changes because carbon, it is carbon black in impregnated polymer. So the carbon black molecules will basically come together if you press it. So its resistance decreases because there is like just because of the percolation theory. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I mean that entire thing because it is like encapsulated in a thin film, it is it's very impermeable, I mean it is not really, it, it does not get affected by a lot of things. Okay. Humidity definitely no. Uh, and neither like you know external environments, temperature might vary because I mean temperature like will basically impermeate everything. It might affect it, but we haven't really seen in our reliability studies at least that it's making a big difference. And same thing as uh, or even you told uh, putting into the vehicle. Have you also seen because the vehicle will always have suspension? Yes, or the vehicle will have certain noise on the streets. In those situations, because in static, I agree. But when your surface itself is moving and vibrating. Will, will this be effective? I think we will have to, a lot of research needs to be done. Probably mm -hmm. we, can, we can baseline uh, what kind of vibrations we are getting from the motor and if, if there are like you know uh, uh, some kind of uh, you know jerky motion is there, we will probably have to sort of baseline everything and then on top of it build an algorithm that will detect uh, certain things. So that will probably require a lot more data. Uh, right now we are just working with simple algorithms uh, and, and typically the, the, the mats that we have sold so far. They, they basically have just denoising in them and we basically make the color map for the doctor. So the, the, all the algorithm is done in the doctor. So there is no, no algorithm in the mat. I mean we just show the doctor the image and then they, they can do whatever they want with the image and write their prescriptions and everything else. So, uh, so we have not really I mean gone into like because that requires a lot of data as well. 
So, yeah, uh, one of the re reliability issues is that it actually over the years it basically start, starts uh, sort of compressing, right? We press it all the time, like for a year or so. So, that really sort of its baseline re resistance kind of follows a specific, uh, you know, creep uh, function. So, that is where we are also looking at to sort of optimize our algorithm so that we know how the reliability works. So, that is why that two year study is actually a very important uh, thing as well in this. Dr. Sachin actually, um, uh, I think Professor Ramesh actually for this, uh, we were also in touch with him, this air pollution uh, detection actually, uh, long back I had a discussion. So, even we are working on a similar topic, maybe we can exchange our notes sure, and sure. Um, happy to. we can also uh, uh, see that. But um, one thing I like about the camera part the, with, the, with the perception, you can uh, see and you try to do that. So, that is a really good thing I like. Thanks. Actually. The good thing is that most of the cars will have camera. I'm saying that, that's, what so that's, that's an interesting what, uh, thing actually. I I I, I liked it. So and to scale, especially uh, in cities and all, uh, I think stationary uh, deployment will not work. We need uh, this kind of a mobile because uh, to maintain stationary deployment is huge challenge. Uh, like with 50 so. nodes, we are like crying really. <laughs> so. No, no, it's definitely, in a, uh, as you rightly said, nowadays every car has a uh, rear view camera, etc. So you can use it. So I like that uh, view. Yeah, Maybe we can touch sure, base sure. with you. I'll be very happy. From from yeah. And in 3D modeling, I have one question. Uh, just, just for my understanding, uh, very interesting. Uh, at least for me, I don't come from that background, so very interesting for me. But I was thinking uh, a corner case. Just, just for example, if I stand and there's a air, air comes on and my coat is flying. Uh, is that how, how do you measure? Do you say that I'm so fat uh, because you don't know that's the air? Yeah, you yeah. just take an image, and um, how would you so, uh, how would you portray me when I die so fat? Uh, no, so like uh, it's actually a very corner case, and so that's uh, we f actually we face the same problem when we work with long skirts kind of thing, because all the models that we, we were trying, all the data sets are they are mostly related to European or Western population and they, are th they don't have those loose ropes and all. So whenever we run some assembly fitting model, it always gives a fat kind of shape for them. So, but we then collected our data and then we train on that. So it can generalize to uh, these kind of unseen loose clothing cases. But the case that you were saying that wind is flowing and that, so I don't think just with one sample it will be able to generalize, but if it sees, let's say, two, three sequences of different kind of motions, then it can analyze on basis of that and then it can give you a correct yeah, on the same uh, idea that you presented, I think uh, the Mintras and the Amazons of the world, uh, you should talk yeah, actually, about. Yeah, actually, yes, talking. I did one internship with Mintra and like built yeah. similar system for them, actually. Because the number of, uh, you know, returns that's happening, it's a big cost yes, for yes, Mintra yeah, right. today and also for Amazon, right? So I think uh, this is a universal problem to solve. Yes. And uh, they have some AI working on, working behind, okay, they tell this is the size uh, that is recommended for you and things like that based on that, but it is not foolproof, right? Yes. So that is something uh, that you can work on. But we have to, I, I, we should also have a discussion. Yeah, we definitely. are working on some avatar-based uh, uh, solutions on yeah. metaverse. Oh. So it could be a possible thing yeah, so definitely. to create the real avatars of yes, yes. Uh, people and so, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Anyone else in the audience? they take measurements and things like that regularly. They do it for thousands of students, right? Can you actually, can this technology work in such a way that you can actually, you know, take the, automatically take all the parameters yes. and uh, give it to the tilers and they will actually, you know, get, get it for each of the students separately with the standard sizes, right? Yes, correct. So actually, uh, this is called uh, the sizing problem. So what one simple solution is, why not let ask the customer what's its shape and size is, rather than just detecting it from his image. Uh, uh, if he wants a cloth which fits to his body shape, he can. He has no problem in giving a correct uh, body proportions. So that is a one potential aspect of it. Like say, you know, it is uh, probably a lot of inconvenience for the st students, parents, 
lot of people need to come go to the school and then actually you know they have to wait for a long time and then oh, okay. e even after uh, like say you know the dresses get made actually right some are short some are long and they make mistakes so if if we can actually standardize it in some way right which simplifies the whole process kind of thing it would help uh, probably your case in a big way yes so uh, this is not our technology but in germany what they have this parametric body model and what they do is they ask you to come in very tight fitting cloth and just from a simple one image or two three images they can get a body proportions and sizing which is super easy i think i answered your question thanks no that's not yeah No, no, I understand what you're saying, but their problem is much more complex. The modeling a clothing is their problem. Body measurement is a solved problem. It can be done even today. I'm sure if you give him one week, he will build it for you. But that is not the focus right now. They're dealing with a much complex problem. Okay, Prakash. Okay. So he, he's already getting his off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this was an experiment. I mean, especially Ajay and Praveen. Uh, we're going to do a much more deeper session, closed door, uh, next month. So where like we will have like, uh, because this needs more time and like, uh, so today we're just experimenting with it as part of the anniversary event. But we will do a deeper session in January. We'll pick a few uh, by area. We'll do some in mobility, we'll be some in healthcare. We'll identify three, four. And so most uh, welcome, we invite you if you can make it. Uh, so they will have closed doors this session. We'll have a deeper conversation, so actual feedback. Uh, but today was more experimental, but just to get a sense. So to the last part, we just another few minutes. Uh, so the uh, the Applied AI Centers, uh, especially I have, does work with uh, uh, with the startups as well. Uh, so we have few startups that has been supported uh, by the center already. So we invited a few uh, to do a quick lightning pitch just to get a sense of what are these startups that we are uh, working with. And uh, if anybody wants to talk to them, we'll always set up meetings later. But today was just to introduce some of the startups. Uh, that the center is supporting, the hub is supporting. So, Nirupa, we are all yours to introduce the startup and get them on. Um, so, I quickly request all the founders to make way in the front, just so that it will be easier for us to coordinate. Can we have Shravan, Ananya, Shankar and Anis? So, I leave the... Uh, introduction and pitching to the founders because I think they'll do the best job. Uh, Shavan, we'll start with you. Hello, everyone. Hope you're having a lovely day. I'm sure it's been, a, you know, exhausting, but a lovely conference. Thanks for this opportunity. We'll be so I'm Shravan. I'm an alumni of uh, AAAT Allahabad and uh, uh, Indian School of Business right next door. So we are in the EV space. We have built uh, something uh, unique in the EV space. Before going into that, just a quick survey. So who all have experienced a you know, cab cancellation? <laughs> right? Uh, quite a you know, <laughs> everyday issue. Yes. Uh, so who all have, you know, out of desperation or otherwise, have experienced like a bike taxi? who all have uh, exposure to bike taxi. OK, good, good. So yeah, primarily, like, you know, how would you describe uh, the experience, right? Uh, it's ki quite a jugad that uh, we have uh, had to, like, within our infrastructure, we have brought in something. It's a concept that has been running in the, uh, you know, in Thailand and Southeastern countries for last 10 years or so. Uh, we have kind of, uh, you know, adapted that. Can we uh, put we'll that? Do the okay, okay. Yeah. I, I thought it was. Uh, <laughs> I was waiting for that. Okay. So yeah, I just wanted to uh, uh, see. There are around thousand plus EV startups today, right? Uh, uh, every nook and corner you can find one, but all of them, without exception, are working on one single problem, that is tailpipe emissions, right? Uh, 
So without exception, everyone is working, which is a very, very important problem for a greener future, uh, for a brighter tomorrow, for our next generation. But uh, each and every one of them is, uh, you know, uh, undermining or ignoring the problems of today, right? At the same time, we need to build for a uh, better tomorrow, but uh, the problems of today are being ignored. Whether, you know, uh, you know, two-wheelers are 30 times more prone to fatality during an accident compared to any other vehicle, right? It's like uh, one pandemic every two to three years. That's the scale of uh, epidemic of road accidents that's happening. And uh, whether it's a working mom who just needs to pick her kid from school or an elderly woman who just needs to visit a nearby temple, there is not a single, you know, uh, two-wheeler that is comfortable for them to use, right? Uh, they're sitting on the sides, holding their kids, holding to the bike for their life. So that's the kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, stunts that they are forced to do. So that's why we have created a very unique model. It'd be good if we can show or demonstrate. Suppose be a lightning pitch. Sure, sure. So that, that, that's why it will be more impactful when they see the actual vehicle. But uh, it uh, brings the comfort and convenience of an SUV car with physical distancing between a rider and uh, the, you know, pillion. So that's why we are focusing on the bike taxi market to be start. But even it can be extended tomorrow to as an, uh, as an upgrade or a, you know, alternative for a typical scooter that we use, right? If you look at any urban community, big family, 3BHK, you have, uh, 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 you have one car and one scooter or bike, right? If the guy needs to show off, it will be a bullet or something of that sort. Otherwise, it's a typical scooter. Plus, yeah, on the other side, you will not find uh, today, at least, not a typical car, right? Everyone's after SUVs. Why is it so? Because we value the more than the speed. What is valuable for our Indian consumer is the, uh, is the comfort, is the safety, is the stability, and the space that an SUV offers, right? So where is the alternative when it comes to uh, scooters? That's what we have uh, tried to build. Uh, this is a short video that you can see. You can uh, speed it up so that you'll be better understand what we are building. It's, uh, that's fine. It'll, it'll just start. So this is the, our vehicle that uh, we have built. Uh, compared to any other typical, <laughs> you know, scooter or bike out there, it's much more comfortable, especially for pillions. You can uh, sit in, sit on a sari. Uh, you can sit uh, with, even with, uh, you know, your kids and all in between. You can bring in your own luggage, at least airport cabin luggage. We can uh, fit into this vehicle. So we have a couple of variants that brings in the additional stability. Our unique patented technology is the stabilization that we bring. There are many other trikes across the world in Europe, in Southeast Asia, but all of them uh, use either very expensive technology to stabilize or uh, very energy demanding uh, technology. So we have made it more affordable, uh, more stable for the Indian market, uh, bringing in the additional stability. The, that, that's what we are uh, offering. You know, you can understand the, there are several use cases. Everyone else is building just another scooter, just another bike. Right, uh, what the Indian consumer, whether the farmer or the Kirana store guy in the rural consumer, what he wants is, uh, he doesn't have the affordability of an urban family that you have one vehicle for personal use, one vehicle for livelihood, right? He wants one vehicle where he can uh, earn his livelihood at the same time, you know, uh, at the same time uh, take his family out. So that's what we are building. We have uh, 2,000 plus orders. Uh, currently with uh, fleet operators, both in logistics and bike taxi segment. So our team is, uh, you know, multi um, uh, multi -fun cross-functional team. You know, my, our partner uh, is ex-railways guy who has 20 plus patents. He has worked with all metros in India. Uh, he's bringing some of the principles that we brought are how large locomotives are, you know, stabilized on a very small track. Right, so that's the, our unique engineering, our patented technology, and uh, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have Ananya, please? Put the main slide and leave it. 
Good evening, everybody. I am Ananya, co-founder of Triolt Energy Private Limited. So we focus on the development of lithium-ion cell technology, for especially for EVs in, for Indian climatic conditions. Okay. Yeah. So the problem what we address is one is the we take longer charging time when we go for uh, the cell technology. We we face like the uh, the customers, they uh, believe like it takes long cha longer charging time. That is one of the problem we want to address. And the other one is the cycle life and the calendar life of the cells. Because when we, uh, when a customer purchase one EV, the, he's worried like uh, how many years I'll be able to use it. So in that aspect, they are worried. So we have to see like uh, how we can increase the cycle life and the calendar life of the cells. And other third one is the import duty, sorry, import dependency. So right now, we are importing 100% lithium-ion cells. So that hinders EV adaptation. And how we address the problem? So we make the lithium-ion cells in the parcel format and 2700 lithium-ion cells format. And we offer fast charging. That means the cells can be charged within 15 minutes. We achieved in the prototype level. We could, make, we could charge the cells in the 15 minutes. And we can draw the current 10 times more than the age of the cell. Suppose the cell is having one age cell, we can draw up to 10 amps. So that we achieved. And uh, so the first two criteria we achieved, one is the cycle life and the uh, faster discharging. And other third one is the we need to achieve, like um, if we use a cell, um, how, uh, like, uh, how the cycle life uh, in terms of like uh, uh, ch longer charging, I mean like um, how can you do the faster charging? If you uh, do 15 minutes charging, how long you'll be able to use it? How many times, how many years you have to use it? So that testing we are going on. So we have finished uh, something around 150 cycles. So in the commercial standards, when we compare, we need to get it uh, something around 300 to 500. So we compared all the data with the commercial cells, which, uh, which is available in the market, Panasonic, LG, and uh, Samsung, BAK, and all these cells. So what, uh, how we are unique is we could make it 15 minutes. All other um, competitors are providing 30 minutes fast charging. And other, th other thing is like the LG and BAK is providing fast charging in 15C and 12.5C. We could achieve a 10C. We are here a little different. They are charging in 30 minutes and uh, giving a discharging of 10C rate. That means 10 times more than the capacity of the cell. But we could charge it in 15 minutes and we can make the discharge of 10 times more than the cell. And the cycle stability test is going on and uh, we targeted to get around 1,000 cycles. So that's what we are now, and uh, we are eagerly looking for the funding for going to the next stage. Yeah. Sorry, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Shankar, can we have you here, please? We have Shankar from Sputnik. Yeah. So uh, hey everyone, uh, it's Sputnik Brain. Uh, we are working on building a non-invasive brain modulation device towards alleviating the three hundred billion dollars suffering of stress. Uh, if you are not stressed, if you are not stressed, I am stressed. So one in every three people, the stats are right. Uh, <laughs> so uh, and we're technically reviewed, scrutinized, and funded by IIT Madras and the Department of Biotechnology, Triple uh, IIT also very soon. <laughs> And uh, the tech we're using uh, has been called as a paradigm shift in psychiatric research by top researchers from Brown University and Stanford investing in establishing complete labs for it. Our approach has been towards uh, leveraging this tech for novel application of stress alleviation clinically. Um, and the product fundamentally is a brain modulation device that sends in safe impulses to certain specific mood centers in the brain, um, oscillating, uh, uh, causing neural memories to oscillate, thereby um, you know, causing mechanosensitive ion channels to move and thereby causing uh, stress relief, right? Uh, fundamentally, like, whichever, uh, you know, stressful situation you are in, right, regardless of whether it's, like, you know, uh, VC partners or it could be, like, you know, carry, hurdle rate, uh, it could be, you know, like, you know, painful uh, family members, <laughs> whichever, whichever situation, right? The same brain regions become active um, in terms of the physiology, human physiology. Um, and so, and, you know, electrical activity passes through those regions, right? Similarly, there's one for uh, pleasure, human pleasure, and um, that's the reason, you know, Instagram, Facebook, binge watching, winning an election, um, you know, favorite foods, all the human pleasure, the same brain regions become active, nuclear accumbens or reward systems. So what we're doing is we're sending uh, safe waves to those regions in a, in a very, very um, clinically validated method, 
uh, towards stimulating on demand, stress elevation, and pleasure. And yeah, um, competing directly with Elon's neural, neural link, but uh, in a non surgical method. We don't ask you to you know, drill holes into your skull. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. So, the reason was like uh, metaphorically the satellite into the brain. So, yeah. Thanks. I like not drilling holes into the skull. Sorry? <laughs> I like not drilling holes into the skull. Yes, it's very important. <laughs> like, I mean, like, the skull has, like, I mean, like, it's good, like, if it doesn't, there's no coin or something which, which goes inside it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have our last startup we'll be showcasing today, uh, Anise for Pi Star. Uh, hello, everyone. So, let me start with a quick question. So how many of you all have never ever experienced foot pain or joint pain in their life? Yeah. Everyone have suffered with that, right? So this is the problem. Let me share you the stats. So one in every three persons suffer from foot pain at some point in their lives. In addition to this, the most critical foot related problem is diabetic foot ulcers. It's the number one reason worldwide for foot ulceration. See, uh, like every quarterly or half yearly, we get our blood test done, diabetes test, everything done, but not our food screening. This is because of the present diagnosis method. It, uh, the present diagnosis method basically involves manual screening by the doctors, which depends upon the experience of the doctors. And it's an outdated and a time consuming method. Because like every patient, when they go, uh, they'll be like, when the doctors does some testing and all, some reports and all, they'll be more satisfied after seeing the evidence approach. So uh, then some of the doctors have a Harris mat, which costs around 70,000 rupees, which is like a, a foot imprinting method. So you stand on a foot imprint and you get a stamp of your foot, which is not a reliable and a accurate method. And around only 2 to 3 percent of doctors in India have an imported digital scan system that cost a fortune, around 6 to 10 lakh of rupees. So what if I tell you that we can present a digital, automated, the most affordable intelligent food scanning system. Yes, that's right. So I, ladies and gentlemen, would proudly present our digital automated school food scanner, which is highly advanced patented flexible technology that will give you complete plantar pressure analysis in just five seconds. So it does not require any trained person to operate. The doctor can just connect it directly to their laptop and see the complete analysis. And it's uh, affordable so that every hospital and clinic can have it. And it is a complete in-house hardware manufacturing and software design. So, just a video. Just a video. Yeah. Uh, the next one. Yeah. Okay. okay. So okay. the doctor with our technology will be basically able to determine what the problem the person is facing. If he's having a flat foot or joint pain, more pressure on heels, poor feet, everything can be identified. Plus, they can uh, prescribe them with customized insoles so that uh, they uh, correct their posture and uh, have a good, uh, like, analyze the gait analysis, correct their posture and everything. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We still have almost 40, 50 people in the room. Uh, we have dinner served, so please just have a quick dinner before you leave, or you can stay as long as you want, but if you're in a hurry, at least quickly pick up uh, something to eat and go. It's just right in the next block. And uh, so thank you so much. It is, um, I think, it's very nice for us. We'd like to celebrate all the fantastic work that happens. Uh, it's a large uh, group of people, apart from our own faculty and students, that work uh, in these centers and behind these efforts. And uh, and a lot of them put specifically towards this event. We had the whole I have team and like uh, of course Varma helped curate uh, all the sessions and uh, the incubator team. Uh, Pavan fiscally from I have was very involved uh, in anchoring this whole thing. It's easy for people like me to give ideas. Let's do this. Somebody has to do it. Uh, so uh, they've all done a fantastic job. Thank you so much. And uh, there were any final words? Okay, good. Thank I you so much. They so were all I have team quickly a group picture. For a picture, but yeah. all the others, please, while they take the pictures. Ashtar, sir. Yeah. The founders as well. Yes, Deva, sir. Uh, please request the founders on the stage once. Yeah. Uh, we'll take the picture with the startup. One picture with the startup. Call the everybody here. Anis? Anis? Yes. Huh? We would sign now. I think we have to change this a little bit. This is IHUB. Yeah, yeah, this is for IHUB. Yeah, but the new one. No, we change the name. No, there's a mistake. Okay. We'll take care of it, don't worry. Yeah. We have to redo the signing.